And welcome to the Talking Archive. My name is Josh Jacobs, and it's an honor to be speaking with the former producer of The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. And uh, he's also been in NBC News as well as many local and uh, network television news organizations. Dave Berg, thanks for uh, being with us today. Thanks for having me, Josh. Well, tell us about yourself growing up and what influenced you to get into broadcasting. I uh, uh, basically I grew up in the Chicago area and uh, spent a lot of time in quite a number of cities throughout the Midwest because I w- ended up being in uh, local television news and pretty much ended up in all the markets. But I think I was uh, influenced by uh, uh, one. I was very impressed with the Chicago Tribune, which billed itself as the world's greatest newspaper. Mm-hmm. So I kind of bought into that. I believe it. WGN and Radio. That is correct. I was also a big fan of WGN Radio and Paul Harvey on the radio. Um, Radio was always my first preference um, next to the Tribune because of the great influence of a man that probably not every one of your listeners has heard of, but his name was Paul Harvey, who was a uh, very iconic, unique uh, commentator. The rest of the story, a great, great uh, legend there. Right. And did you ever get to meet meet uh, Paul Harvey? I did, um, and and I I got to meet Paul Harvey as as I often got to meet many of my uh, uh, childhood heroes. I just booked him on the Tonight Show, hmm. and that that's how I got to meet him. But <laughs> um, we did do our show in Chicago, where, where Paul Harvey uh, originated, uh, and I booked him to make some some appearances on the show while we were in Chicago. Um, and, uh, but, but, but prior to that, I'm thinking I, as, as I'm answering your question, I actually met him when I was a, uh, a, a teenager. My dad knew somebody who knew somebody. So I got to sit in on one of his broadcasts mm-hmm. and I was so overwhelmed by being in the presence of Paul Harvey. And if you, if, if any of your listeners has, has ever listened to Paul Harvey, if you were to, to sort of imagine in your mind what God sounds like, it would be Paul Harvey. So here I see this man, I'm in his presence in the radio booth, and after he does his broadcast, he says, tell me a little bit about yourself. Mm. And I couldn't speak. <laughs> I was so in awe and so intimidated, I couldn't speak. Mm. What? Uh, later when I booked them on the Tonight Show. Wow. So, uh, you know, it's interesting because I remember I used to listen to him, especially I love the rest of the story, which was out here locally on uh, Talk Radio 790 KBC. And my parents are from Chicago, so my, they both remember Paul Harvey very, very well. Uh, my dad grew up, well, they were both from Chicago proper, but then in their later years as they became teenagers, my dad was in Evanston, my mother in uh, Naperville. And so you had a lot of great legends there, but definitely Paul Harvey was, I think, the top legend uh, in the Windy City. There, indeed. And um, now, when you first uh, got into uh, broadcasting, what opportunities did you have to intern with the Chicago stations? I I basically had none. I I really didn't have any uh, opportunity. I tried and tried and just uh, I, I just couldn't get on in, in any way. So what I ended up doing is when I went to uh, 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 university, which was Northwestern University, mm-hmm. which is in the Chicago area, I just worked at the campus radio station. Mm. And I did, basically did newscasts, interviews, whatever I could. Whenever I could be on, on the, the air on the campus station, that's what I did. Wow. And uh, the campus station there, how big was the signal at the time? It, it wasn't any. I'm sure. I'm sure it hardly extended beyond the campus. <laughs> like a lot of college <laughs> it stations. Was, it was. It wasn't a big powerhouse. Believe me, it wasn't like a, a university, like an FM station um, uh, uh, affiliated with, uh, um, um, you know, N- NPR. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, nothing like that. Although I did end up working at one of those. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, I heard that Northwestern had a pretty good broadcasting program. Um, I wrote a I'm in the middle of writing a book on Jack Berry, the uh, game show legend, and um, his wife Patty went to Northwestern. And Jack, when he first got into broadcasting, NBC had a special summer uh, class series at Northwestern University. And then after he took the class, the uh, head there said, well, you know, you should stick to selling handkerchiefs. You're no good. So Jack said, I'm glad to not take his advice. (laughs) Well, I had had a... a an experience at uh, with the uh, managing editor of the Chicago Tribune that was similar to that. Mm. You, you get a lot of no's along the way. I'm, I'm not telling you anything or anybody listening anything. But I remember after I had I had worked at the Kansas City Star for three years as a reporter, and I got a job as a reporter for National Public Radio. I was able to secure an interview with the managing editor at the Chicago Tribune, which once again was one of the iconic institutions I always wanted to work for. And I, I remember walking in and walking in the, in the newsroom, and, you know, and walking up to the desk of the managing editor. And fr- probably a lot of this is just in my memory and, it, 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 you know, how your memory exaggerates things, mm-hmm. things. But I remember him smoking a big cigar and having a, a you know, a, a, a brim sort of cap on his head and, and looking down, he probably didn't look anything like that, but that's my memory. <laughs> and he, he never looked up. He never invited me to sit down at his desk. He said, um, so, uh, what, uh, what, what, can, what's your name? I said, it, it's Dave Berg. We have a, an interview set up. Oh, all right. Well, uh, well, uh, so tell me, Dave Berg, why are you qualified to work for the Chicago Tribune? And again, he's never looked, he never looked up at me. And I said, well, right now I'm a, a reporter producer for uh, National Public Radio. And, I'm, uh, and, uh, and I used to work for the Kansas City Star. And he said, oh, so you're on the radio. I said, yes, I am. Yes. He said, oh, I see. Well, I don't hire talking dogs. And that was the end of my uh, uh, career aspirations at the Chicago Tribune. Dang. <laughs> but you get a lot of no's, and, and no's come in very strange ways. Yeah. Now, at that NPR affiliate that you worked at, which one was that, and uh, what did you uh, uh, do specifically for them on the air? Right. I was a uh, reporter, producer uh, for uh, the, the campus station at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. UMKC, mm. um, at KCUR was was the station, and I had a a grant from National Public Radio. They gave me a grant to to work for the station as a reporter producer, and then uh, in in doing that job, I filed reports for National Public Radio in Washington. What's your most memorable story that you got to uh, got to uh, contribute to them? Um. I think the, my most memorable story was the, my biggest story um, that I covered in the two years was the, uh, the death watch and funeral of um, uh, former President Harry Truman. Because mm. he went back to his childhood home in Missouri after he left the White House. Mm. And when he got sick, we, uh, we went, to, I'm trying to remember the name of the town that he lived in. It's not coming to me. But I, I was dispatched there from Kansas City, and I, I can remember um, that I, I read, uh, I read hun- you know, scores and scores of articles and books because I didn't want to appear um, like I didn't know what I was doing or like I didn't know anything about Harry Truman in front of all the, uh, you know, uh, reporters from CBS and NBC and ABC I, I wanted to look like I was professional in front of them. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I pulled it off, but I <laughs> learned a lot about Harry Truman. That's great. And uh, d- I guess with him living nearby, you probably never ran into him, is my guess, uh, even though some people might get the impression since it's kind of a smaller town that you did. Um, but you probably didn't. Re- did you ever meet him, just out of curiosity, or get to see him in we person never somewhere? did because he didn't live in Kansas City. It was, I'm, I'm trying, again, I'm, I wish I could remember his hometown. He, he went back and lived in his hometown mm. uh, after he was in the White House. 
Wow. Uh, but no, I never got to meet him. I wish I had because he's one of my favorite all-time presidents. Yeah. In fact, it was interesting because getting back to my Jack Berry book, um, he and several of the juvenile jurors got to meet Harry Truman. They loved him. Um, they just had fond memories of him, and um, it was just a wonderful night for the, the kids to, to meet the then president of the United States at a special function that there was for the president. I forget whether it was the, well, it was the uh, correspondence there. I forget what it was, but it was something that was really neat, and so it was neat to hear that type of a story. But, um, yeah, yeah the, uh, and then... Um, By the way, he lived in, uh, I just looked it up, Independence. That's where he lived. Just a, just a small community, and it was his childhood home. A farm boy from uh, Missouri got to be... Uh... That's what he was. That's what he was. He didn't even go to college. Wow. <laughs> I'll tell you, he, he was a better president than a lot of presidents who went to college, so there, there you go. <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> and um, now after, uh, after Kansas City, where did you go to next? I went to uh, a, 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 quite a... Ser- I went to graduate school is what I did. Mm-hmm. Um. And then from there, I started getting in. Uh, and when I was in graduate school, I was able to um, uh, get a television experience. Mm. Because uh, very often when people are in radio, they want to get in television, which I, which I did, which was a mistaken notion, but that's what I wanted to do. And so I, I went to graduate school at um, uh, Kansas State. Uh, in Manhattan, Kansas, and when I was there, I was the news director at the local cable uh, outlet. Oh, wow. And that's where I got uh, on-air experience. And then from there, I uh, went to various places in the Midwest. I, I, I actually, uh, I, gave, I ended up giving the farm news for uh, Kansas State Extension to the state of Kansas. Oh. And then from there, I went to Green Bay, Wisconsin as the uh, a reporter, and then to Sioux City, Iowa, uh, as the uh, farm director and reporter, uh, and then to Omaha, Nebraska, as the assignment manager, um, uh, reporter, farm director. I did a lot of farm reporting. <laughs> now, during those uh, jobs as well, oftentimes in the smaller markets, not only are, we, are you uh, tasked with you know doing your on-air duties, what type of off the air duties did you do? Because I remember talking with several other DJs that said they had to milk the cows or feed the horses. What type of uh, experience did you have to do like that? Well, I'll, I'll go back to um, uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, uh, first of all, I had a uh, a show at six thirty in the morning, uh, a farm show. Then I had uh, I gave the farm news on on the uh, noon news, and often filled in. For other, if the sports guy was out, I would do the sports. If the news anchor was out, I would do the news. Um, and then I give I gave an e- uh, an evening report on the um, uh, evening news. You know, a little farm report in the six o'clock and ten o'clock news or eleven wow. o'clock. Sorry, ten o'clock news. And I also was the um, I, I I always thought this was a conflict of interest, but it came with the job. I did uh, the uh, sales. I worked in the sales department, selling all of their uh, like fertilizer and feed and uh, you know agriculture products. And this was all live. This was not recorded. The reports that you did at night. No, no. Uh, but although it, uh, um, the ones at night, uh, actually, those were like those were film stories, which I shot and edited for the evening news. Oh, okay. Unless I was filling in on the evening news as sportscaster, anchor, weatherman, whatever it was. Yeah, I remember back in the day when news reporters would do a report, oftentimes it was pre-recorded and that was it. Instead of a pre-recorded report and then seeing them hours later at the scene live where nothing's happening by that point. And uh, I remember when news was like that, which I actually kind of like better because it's like, well, why are you having the reporter out there when nothing's happening out there? Actually, it's interesting. That's actually an interesting question because right around that time is when they started having the live trucks, mm-hmm. where the reporters went live, and I, and I remember uh, there was a uh, there was a story involving a cemetery, mm-hmm. right? And and we sent this reporter out, you know, in the dark in front of the cemetery, and it's like, how is this adding to the story, you know? 
or the other thing that that people always did to this day i see it if they're covering a um uh, an event like a sporting event where they have to go, uh, they often will go to a sports bar. Like if the local team uh, won the World Series or mm-hmm. something and they go to the local sports bar, there's nothing, never go to a live, um, to a sports bar live. It's just crazy in there. Oh, yeah. It's just nuts. But uh, they, uh, because they had the live truck, they would use it. Well, also, you know, the, the, their noise drowns the reporter out, number one. But number two, you know, some of them might be saying some words you can't say on the air. And since most stations don't have the 10-second delay to uh, to carry that, oftentimes, you know, can be re- result in a disaster. I remember back... All the time. All the time. You, you just have... and But they keep sending people to school for <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is the this was the philosophy of my uh, broadcasting teacher, uh, Bob Wright. He was a a weekend anchorman and a field reporter for KNBC Channel Four back from the late well, the mid fifties to about the early seventies. And uh, he said one of the reasons he got out of broadcasting was it, it started becoming too tabloidish. Another reason he said I was pushing forward, and I thought to myself, Do I want to be woken up sometimes at three in the morning to cover a breaking story? So he got his doctorate degree in uh, broadcasting and journalism and decided to teach instead. But he said that, um, unfortunately, the media today, for the most part, uh, they're into the bottom line, which means profit and ratings and not, you know, really delivering a story. Uh, It's kind of animated tabloidish when they do that thing with the whole sports thing live. That's that's just my guess. I'm not sure what your thoughts are on that. No, I, I agree with, with Bob, and I saw I saw as I went from city to city in the Midwest. Um, in, in the early days, we would actually cover city council meetings. Mm. Well, that didn't last long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it soon just became you know covering fires and and you know and 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 homicides. Um, that that's pretty much it. Um, so yeah, it's it's and then the other thing when we started out, if you were going to interview somebody, you figured you would you would you would the interview you'd put about thirty seconds of it in your your video report on the air. Mm-hmm. Back then, it was actually film when I was doing it, but we switched over to video eventually. But uh, but as I would go from city to city, it's like while well, we do our interviews, we drop in our sound bites. They call them. Mm-hmm. Oh, 30 seconds. And then it was like 20 seconds. Then it was 10 seconds. Then it was three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> As people's attention span got shortened. Yeah. One thing I wish they would do since he got the internet and he got, you know, a lot of broadband on websites that's a much larger um, capacity than it used to be. What I wish they would do is they'd, I mean, and some stations do that to their credit. Um, Fox 11 does have like longer form interviews of, different features, but I think they're the only one I can think of. I think NBC4 might have it as well, where they have the entire interview rather than just a, a quick soundbite. I'd like to hear more of what the person's saying than what the reporter's you know, presenting. Um, that would be a nice feature, at least online, that they can't get on television rather than just showing the duplicate of what you already saw on TV. It would be nicer to yeah. have a longer form version of it, uh, maybe even the short form, form version as well. But it would be nice to you know hear more of what the person's saying, what they're expressing. Um, at least that's the way I see it. Uh, maybe that's why I never got into newscasting. <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing that I got concerned, because I, you know, I, I saw how how um, newscasts worked. Um, when I got to the point where people started interviewing me after I, you know, wrote a book about the, my experiences at the Tonight Show, is that I had a policy that I would never do a videotape interview where they could edit it. Smart. I always did live interviews or live, you know, live to tape. I just made it a policy I would never, because I knew they could edit around it any way they wanted. Oh, that's what they do, even with reality television. Uh, I know. Friend of mine, yeah, you're right. A yeah. friend of mine was on the um, Grease reality show. Uh, Grease, you're the one that I want. Where they're casting the new Danny and Sandy, and she was uh, rock star. Sandy was her uh, nickname, and really sweet gal, Juliana. And um, her then boyfriend posted on MySpace. This is how long ago this was, where she said. Um, yeah, I'm a great actress, but my singing is blah, blah, blah. And he said she never said that. 
And I yeah. thought, and he says, if there's anybody saying that there's something wrong with our relationship, that's false too. He was just kind of giving a heads up on in case what they might try to do to bring some drama, if you will. Um, yeah. And I thought to myself, okay, what else are we not getting on this show? Now, she did have a good experience, and she loved everybody there. She especially loved Jim Jacobs, the writer of Grease, as well as Andrew Lloyd Webber, yeah. whom she got to meet. But, um, nice. you know, just... Um, you know, and then the 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 dancing uh, trainer Kathleen Marshall, and so you know it was a great experience for her, and she's now the voice of Miss Wendy in the uh, Toy Story four movies. But you nice. know, it, you know, it just it 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 saddened me, you know, as a friend to say, "Gosh, I mean, I can't believe they're doing this to her." You know, just that's just that's just wrong. Uh, yeah, I agree. This is the Talking Archive. My name is Josh Jacobs. We're talking with Dave Berg, longtime producer of The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, as well as a producer at NBC News. And next.